Now I talk about planting switchgrass all the time and switchgrass is an amazing planting, an amazing grass for not only whitetails, which is what this channel is about, but wildlife. And I talk about that all the time, going back into how to convert an old field. A lot of the articles I have in the past about planting switchgrass, I encompass and include all wildlife when I talk about switchgrass for whitetails. And you know, and, and I'll be honest, a lot of times, and I will admit, we talk about whitetails on this channel all the time. And the lowest hole in the bucket of whitetails is mature box. Easy to have your property full of does and fawns. Very easy. Very hard to attract mature box on a regular basis to your land unless you follow the principles that we talk about in this channel. At the same time, just because we talk about that because it's the hardest to do, we sometimes forget or I forget to mention how powerful some of the habitat improvements we talk about for whitetails are for actual wildlife and all wildlife. Uh, today we're up going out and putting a rabbit hut out and we're going to put several of those in the property just because I want to have more sustainable rabbit populations on the property and there's easy ways to do that we'll talk about that in our january deer chores but bottom line is switchgrass is an exceptional planting tool for all wildlife now don't be confused that there's other grasses especially in the north third even north half of the country that actually work and can provide for sustainable populations of wildlife there's a lot of areas and, and we can go down into missouri uh, maybe southern illinois uh, kentucky west virginia uh, tennessee there's areas southern Ohio where you could plant a grass blend, southern Indiana if I didn't mention that, but you can plant a grass blend, even big blue stem, little blue stem, and it's going to sustain cover throughout the entire winter because it's not laying down, you don't get enough snow. If it does get flattened with wet snow, it's not coming back up, unlike switchgrass which springs back up. So if you want to have that pure cover, you plant switchgrass. Switchgrass is great because it is pure cover. And except for the extreme portions of the upper Midwest, UP and Michigan, locations that, at, that receive annually 200 inches of snow, 100 inches, 150 inches of snow, and you combine wet frozen layers with that, that switchgrass will bounce right back up in the spring, but it can lay down with the snow all winter and not provide cover. So there are those extreme snow depth areas, but we're here in uh, Southeast Minnesota right now where we might average 60 to 80 inches of snow, and that's not enough to push that switchgrass down for the entire winter. There might be two weeks here or there, but as soon as you get a melt, it pops right back up and it provides sustainable cover. So we're gonna talk about that and why that's so critical for um, your wildlife and, and how it really hits that lowest hole in the bucket of cover for the entire year. Number one here, grass is grass. What I mean by that? I've actually had someone say that you shouldn't plant all switchgrass because it wasn't diverse enough. There wasn't enough diversity. It was a monoculture. Folks, that's the idea. You want the grass or the habitat that's going to provide cover for the entire winter. If it's laying down in the winter, it's no good. And don't fool yourself, grass is grass. If it's big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, switch grass, it's all grass. So it really doesn't matter. It's still grass. It can't be eaten. It's not foraged on by wildlife. It's just grass. So it's not providing cover. It's not providing any diversity. It's just more grass. That's like saying that you're planting conifers in a field and you're planting a mix of red pine, white pine, jack pine, scotch pine, saying that it's diversity. So this is somehow better. No, it's just pine. It's still conifer. So you pick which is going to be the best for your circumstance, your soil, your location, and you plant that. And that's when it comes to switchgrass. But I never advocate just planting 10 acres of switchgrass. In fact, I talk about that all the time, how that's bad. You want the true diversity is we take a 10 acre field and you rim that in switchgrass. You provide some switchgrass pockets on the inside so that you in total have, and these pockets could be eighth of an acre, quarter acre, half acre, whatever, use your imagination. There's no set formula. Let's get away from that. I know in the past people talk about this cookie cutter white tail design in your property or food plots. Those are very, very bad because you have to tailor it to your individual settings. For example, you might have low areas in that field, so you can't establish a set pattern. You might have high ridges. You want to put switchgrass for erosion control. You might have a certain area that is really good soil you want your switchgrass cheating more towards that side so you get that ultimate height maybe that's your approach side so you want more screening thickness on that side so there's no perfect approach as far as a set pattern but when you take this and your switchgrass includes about 40 50 60 percent of the area again there's no set percentage 
The rest is early successional growth, just allowing the old field or old pasture to take over into whatever kind of forbs, forages, weeds, hardwood regen, shrubs take place. Or you actually plant them. You can plant some shrubs. We use big rock trees near Chippewa Falls. Tom House and his brother, they have where you can get actual willow cuttings, red osier dogwood cuttings, aspen cuttings. They have several different varieties that you can just stab those cuttings in the ground. I have them planted up here along my road with the hybrid willows for screening. So you can use that. You can use box elder seeds, red maple seeds. There's areas where you can buy raspberries, raspberry bushes that you can plant out there. So kind of use your imagination or there's pollinator plants. Those are great for those areas right there. So then you have an all grass and weed mixture and forbs and forages that you can convert back to ag land if you want someday. You're not putting any woody rootstock in there. You're not growing trees or shrubs. So, you know, it depends on, again, that's why there's no set pattern or so, no set ingredient other than the common denominator of switchgrass. The switchgrass is the cover. Then you can use your imagination on the rest. The so switchgrass, again, should be 40, 50, 60%. Then you're making an actual area that wildlife can be supported because it stands up all winter. If you dilute that with big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, and those grasses lay down here in the winter, and you're left with one and a half pounds of switchgrass per acre, unfortunately what I've seen many times over is that that switchgrass is shaded out by the third, fourth year, and there's no switchgrass representative in the field. They can't tolerate competition by the taller grasses. But secondly, if all that lays down and you only have a pound and a half per acre of switchgrass, you don't have cover. So that's the problem with mixing grasses that actually hinder your ability to provide cover all winter long. And let's face it, wildlife, deer, rabbits, pheasants, birds, butterflies, and bees, they're not looking for cover during the winter or during the summer months. They need it during the winter and it's in desperate and need of habitat and we're shrinking habitat we're losing habitat on a yearly basis especially in ag fields and so this is a great complement to having beautiful ag fields over here and then areas for wildlife over here switchgrass is not food grass is not food so if it's not standing up and providing cover then what good is it just in the name of the diversity i believe in some college courses a universal study University study, they talk about we need diversity. We need to have these mixes together. But don't think of the practical application of, yeah, diversity sounds good. It's a cool word. We talk about diversity out here, meaning areas of grass, areas of hardwood regeneration, areas of conifer, areas of pollinator blend, areas of briars, weeds, apple trees. We have diversity, but diversity is combining different solid blocks of varying types of habitat together in one location, not often mixing them. Because when you mix something, you dilute the amount of browse and actual pollinator value for, for one example. And if you don't mix those pollinators with the grasses, then you actually dilute the cover that the grass is providing. But bottom line is, is grass isn't food. And so that's why the need to separate this out. And that's why you can't blend the two together. You want separate solid grass that's going to be your sustainable cover all year long. And then you want that food value on the other side. So birds, butterflies, bees, pheasants, rabbits, whatever other critters relate to and rely on that other type of non-grass area. So in these areas, the best thing you could do is if you have that surrounded by, with switchgrass, those areas in between pockets of switchgrass and the outside edge you're trying to protect and build for protecting that area, it's great to kill the grasses using a grass specific herbicide to get those out of there because if it's not standing up, it's no good. And if it's falling down, it's terrible. And then at the same time, it's not food. Number three, switchgrass is easy to plant. You can look up, we had a video last year, four ways to plant switchgrass, but I've, if you pull up planting switchgrass for whitetails, and I do have my best bedding area mixes, bedding habitat mixes on my playlist. You can find all these videos in there, but at the same time, you can just search on YouTube. Use that as, a, as your search weapon to find these videos. But you can put in switchgrass for whitetails, switchgrass for wildlife, how to plant switchgrass, four easy ways to plant switchgrass. And all my videos will come up at the top so you can learn this. And I say this consistently. I'm not saying how to do something five years ago and change my mind this year because this stuff works. This is what we've used for years on my own properties, client properties. So this is what work. I've learned a lot, you know, in the past. I worked with someone, Anthony Graham in Michigan, and he taught me a lot about switchgrass. So he's formed a base of my initial knowledge of switchgrass years ago and kind of run with it from there. But, um, you know, Anthony was a really good source for that in the past. Using a drill, 
You know, we've had areas where we've planted switchgrass where we've killed it with spring green up with uh, Roundup and 2,4-D. And then two quarts per acre Roundup, one pint per acre of 2,4-D. And then two or three weeks later, when it greens up again, we've killed it again with Roundup. And then once we get into our April time, end of April, early May in the upper Midwest area we're here, then we're drilling switchgrass into that area. It pushes that seed down just a, a small distance into the soil. And when it gets enough moisture during the growing season, it'll pop up. It takes a little bit to germinate moisture. A lot of times people focus on that 58, 59 degree soil temperature and wonder where their switchgrass is, but they haven't had rain in three weeks. You have to have more moisture and the correct soil temperature to get your switchgrass to jump. But that's an easy way to drill it in. Exposed soil might be that you sprayed three times a year before and it's just open soil. It might be that it was a f existing food plot where you planted weed or practiced weed control or maybe an ag field, an open ag field. They have a lot of clients that convert ag field to wildlife habitat. But you can simply frost seed by planting into exposed soil. So you're frost seeding into these, these areas right here. Very easy to do. I use a Earthway Model 2750 red bag spreader. I set that at about one and a half, and that'll give you a rate of about eight to 10 pounds per acre, depending on how fast you walk. You're just spinning it at a moderate rate, and you're putting that on that exposed soil. After I do that, even though it's been chemically controlled, I still hit it with Simazine before spring green up. That's a pre-emergent, just three quarts per acre. After it emerges, and you have that green up, not the switchgrass, but the weeds, they emerge then two to three weeks after spring green up, I'm hitting it with Roundup and 2,4-D, and then I'm just letting it go after that. Now, the one thing about 2,4-D, it will injure or kill young switch. So if you're close to that green up area, you're close to the area that, that uh, switchgrass would actually germinate, then I would hold off on the 2,4-D. You need to allow about two to three weeks of lag time for that to that residual to get out of the soil. And the thing about the switchgrass though, it's not gonna germinate until right after your corn's germinating. So think about that in your area, if corn's still in the fields and it's not even close to being germinated or it's still a week away, you're not seeing that corn emerge, then you can kill the green in those areas because the switchgrass isn't, hasn't emerged yet. Most of the time here in Southeast Minnesota, Southwest Wisconsin, Southern Michigan, over in northern Pennsylvania, southern in New York, you're looking at an emergence date of late May, middle of May to late May, early June. It depends on the spring. So it emerges quite late, you know, often six to eight weeks after the first weeds pop in the spring. So you have a lot of time to take care of the weeds, but you need to take care of the weeds as much as you can, as often as you can. But you cannot spray glyphosate or 2,4-D on that young switch without killing it, most likely. So don't do that. The great thing about all these, and you can spray in the spring, it's another way, if you check out the four easy ways to plant spritzgrass we had last year, spraying in the spring. I'll take other areas this year. We'll probably mow them once we can get out there and just get some of the weeds down. I'll throw switch into those areas first. We'll mow it, as soon as spring green up comes, I'll hit it with 2,4-D and Roundup, and I'll probably have time to hit it again. I'll hit it with Simazine before spring green up. So we can practice several forms of weed control before it actually germinates in late May, early June. And then it's important to mow and mow and mow. What you're doing is if you see those weeds competing with the switchgrass and the weeds are getting taller, you mow it so the sunlight can get down to the top of the switch. Switchgrass has exponential growth. That means it starts to germinate in June. By the end of June, it might be two, three inches tall. By the end of July, it's seven, eight inches tall. And by the end of August, it's 40 inches tall. So exponential growth, it is amazing. This is the growth rate you want to get that switch to because when you mow and you mow those weeds off, the switchgrass is going to, do going to dominate everything eventually. So when you mow in you know, that first year to end of June, you're mowing in July, you're giving the switchgrass to outcompete the weeds eventually. And after that last mowing in late July, July early August, that switchgrass will take off. You'll notice that switchgrass above all your weeds and all the other growth in the field, and then you know you've succeeded. It might even, be the, it might even mean that you have to mow the following year. A bottom line, it's easy to succeed if you plan. Plan to use chemicals before the switchgrass germinates or emerges in the spring. You can use Simazine the second year before spring green up, and it won't hurt the switchgrass. Three quarts per acre before spring green up. If you hit it after, it's just not going to hurt anything. You know, it's a pre-emergent, they call it a pre-emergent for a reason. It kills weeds before they come, emerge in the spring, not after. But you can always mow. 
And so a lot of times that second year we have switchgrass out here planted the exact same way with similar looking field conditions, just different areas of the property. Some areas I'll just let go completely this year, not worry about it. Other areas I'll hit with simazine, and then other areas I'll hit with simazine and mow until I get it to that exponential growth phase. The second year of the switch growth, the switch emerges at spring green up. So you hit it at a time where it's in that exponential growth phase compared to everything else. It's already there. That second year, it takes for that first year to build up to August to get there. We have switchgrass out here that's one year old switchgrass. It's in that three foot to 40 inch range, possibly four feet in some areas when you consider the seed head that's on top. But we have a lot of switch that was left alone that grew to that height. And then we have others that are full of weeds. We need to mow in probably late April, early May, when those weeds are starting to get 15, 18 inches high. And then we can get it down to that switchgrass so the switchgrass can eventually, to ta uh, eventually take over. It's easy to succeed with switchgrass if you practice chemical control, control to begin with and if you mow, if you plan to mow. But if you just let it go, you might get lucky and you establish a good stand. But you probably won't. And so a lot of times, maybe three years later, you'll see switchgrass pop up and that's happened too. But by mowing and continuing to mow, if you have weeds present, once you get that switchgrass growing and germinated, you can find great success. Again, switchgrass is about helping wildlife and providing cover that's not readily there. You know, we have early successional growth in some of the areas around here, open fields of dogwood and little pockets of a hardwood coming in, goldenrod, ragweed, in some of those dogwood pockets, combined with a blowdown or something, there's enough cover value within a 10 acre field that a quarter acre of that field or a half acre of that field might have enough briars and dogwood growth that there's actually wildlife in there. But make sure you don't follow the advice if someone's telling you just allow it to go to early successional growth, that can take 10, 15, 20 years, even more. We have a field in Wisconsin that's been 70 years since they farmed it and it's still not filled in. It takes a long time to fill in. Switchgrass can provide that cover right away. We've had rabbits living in it in the first year. We have rabbit pellets under the switchgrass when we're out there in February and March, just first year switchgrass. So it doesn't take long for, to provide the necessary cover to not only support whitetail habitat, screen your access from whitetails, but to actually provide enough cover to have sustainable wildlife populations. And don't think it's just all grass. Again, you can add pollinator blends in the mix of it different types of plantings, the shrub plantings from big rock trees and Tom Haas. There's great opportunity for you to have the best of both worlds all in the same spot and switchgrass is that base necessary cover that not only whitetails need, but all forms of wildlife. Folks, I wanna make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.